that aren't familiar, uh, I'm Tim Schultz. I'm the adversary emulation lead here at Scythe. So previously I've worked at Sandia National Labs and also for the MITRE Corporation. So I worked on the attack team and uh, also just the adversary emulation. If you're familiar with like the attack evaluations, those are all things that uh, that I've helped with in the past. So really familiar with adversary emulation, sort of purple teaming. And so that's what we're going to be diving in here today. So as I mentioned before, this is a hands-on workshop. So we will get the, uh, the links up and running. And so that's with the VMware learning platform. And so part of this lab is going to allow you to play the three major roles within purple teaming, which are uh, that of a cyber threat intelligence analyst, that of a red team, and then also seeing, uh, seeing like what you can see from the attacks as a blue team. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have a lecture to sort of introduce the key concepts around purple teaming. And then throughout this entire time, uh, and when we get it working, you will be able to jump into the lab environment that has its own self-paced manual that you can work through. And so we've got a couple different systems there where you can test out Scythe and try things out. And from there, uh, you know, the way we're going to do it is after uh, the lecture is done, we'll dive into the lab, we'll go through a, just a small part of it. And then from there, uh, we'll do probably do like a break, like 15, 20 minutes to allow people to work through it. Then I'll go to the next one. And so for those of you that want to jump ahead at that point, you can keep going. And uh, but for those of you that also want to work through it sort of with me uh, at, a, at a little bit of a slower pace, then that's that's sort of the way I'm going to be teaching this. So uh, we'll dive into the actual lab a little bit later. But first, uh, I want to talk about purple teaming. And so that's overall what this workshop is about, is purple teaming and learning about what purple teaming is, how it can benefit you. And so, uh, you know, it's not just another color. It's something that you can take back with you. And that's ultimately what we're hoping for from, uh, from this workshop is obviously you get some hands-on reinforcement of these concepts, but also understanding how you can apply this back to your organization because you know your organization better than we do. And so all of this needs to sort of be tailored for it to be extremely effective. So the other part is highlighting a couple of the resources and tools that we provide. Obviously, we are Scythe, we have our enterprise platform, uh, but we also have some other things. We have the Purple Team Exercise Framework, which uh, our CTO, George Ortiz, has uh, released. And you can get, uh, there's a link later. You can also search uh, Scythe PTEF in Google and a link should pop up. And then we also release new adversary emulation plans uh, around Threat Thursday. And so we've released recently the Conti emulation plan. Before that, we had DarkSide. So uh, we have several different ransomware emulations, a couple from uh, our friends over at MITRE that have released their own emulation plans. We have a Scythe version of that. So we have this really large library of plans for you to work from and sort of use to equip yourself with uh, a standard set of plans. And then of course you can customize them to, to your own organization. And then of course, everyone that's attending this uh, is going to get CPE credits. And so that is at the end of the lab that we've got that. So overall, sort of diving into our purple team roadmap. Uh, so what is a purple team? We're going to sort of go over the quick roles. I've given you a small like introduction of, of those three roles between CTI, red, and blue. We'll dive into those, talk about how we've uh, moved through ethical hacking and sort of how we've arrived at purple teaming. And then we'll, we'll go through different methodologies, how you can apply it, how you can think about it, the key role that cyber threat intelligence plays in this, and then walking through all of the steps of a purple team, including preparation, the actual exercise flow itself, and then lessons learned, and then we'll get into the hands-on workshop part. So what is a purple team? This is always the question, you know, we, we hear out, we have a red team, we've got a blue team, we have cyber threat intelligence, which is oftentimes either its own team or part of blue team. So what makes it a purple team? 
So the purple team is sort of the melding together of all three of these areas of expertise. And so we've got here the sort of key insights that each team can provide. And, and I'll start at the bottom because defenders, the blue team are sort of our foundation here. These are, this is the security operations center hunt team. This may be a few people with a lot of hats or separate, uh, a large team that sort of has separate responsibilities. And so on top of that, uh, you want to test everything that you are deploying to make sure that any new attacks, things like that, that come out uh, are stress test, at least your detections are. And that's where you have a red team. Red team will come in and oftentimes either do a, uh, a blind test, right, where they don't have any access and they have to find their way in. Maybe it's an assumed breach, which we're big fans of. And then they can uh, sort of start with an inside post-compromise view. And so those are the types of tests that they're doing. They are testing the assumptions that the organization has made. They're testing whether risks that have been accepted uh, are something that, that could be exploited easily. So that's sort of, they're the ones that are trying to poke holes in things to, to see, uh, see where they can. And at the sort of newest player to this is cyber threat intelligence. Now, despite being what I'll, I'll say a, a newer player to this team, it has provided a really critical piece of information that was missing uh, previously, and that's context. And so cyber threat intelligence is going to be your team that is going to understand what are adversaries in your area doing that are targeting your industry. And what are the TTPs, which is the tactics, techniques, and procedures that those adversaries are doing? Because as you'll see when we get to the MITRE attack matrix, uh, is that 100% coverage is just not possible. And there's all sorts of you know, philosophical questions around what does 100% coverage actually mean? And so you're much better uh, equipped as an organization, as an enterprise, picking and choosing specific techniques the adversaries are using that are targeting organizations like yours and making sure that you have depth in each of those techniques, because those are gonna be the areas, you're not gonna be able to detect everything. So where are the detections that you would deem the most critical? And this is where cyber threat intelligence is gonna give you some of those answers. And that's why pairing it with a red team, is gonna show you where you should be testing. And so that's sort of the, the summation of a purple team here is those three sets of expertise together. And so we often think, how hard can it be? You just put some red teamers and blue teamers together. Maybe this is one or two people in your company uh, or, or somebody that just thinks like this. You put it together and that's how it works. Uh, and so that's where we have this nice vision of everyone uh, cooperating, working together. And that's oftentimes not the real case. And so some of this has some historical, uh, some his history behind it because red teams were often uh, brought in to do a sort of test and it was very much a win-lose. And so the red team either won by getting through and uh, you know breaching the defenses, finding holes, or the blue team uh, was able to stop the red team, in which case they're like, hey, we're, we're good, we're unhackable, you know, something like that. So that's, that sort of mindset has is sort of deep roots, unfortunately, in some of uh, the information security community. And so as we've matured, we've continued to build uh, a better understanding of how to communicate, how to collaborate. But that's sort of how purple teaming has come up. So I do want to start out with sort of a, a case study, a success story of Scythe uh, that we, our customer was really nice that we were able to share. And so uh, just to give you sort of what purple teaming can look like and sort of that to help provide that vision for what it could do for your organization. So uh, National Motor Freight Traffic Association uh, was really nice. I want to give them a huge shout out for uh, letting us uh, publicize this and talk about it because this is something that not every organization, you know, wants to be a case study in a purple team exercise uh, workshop. And so we did a six week purple team exercise with them. So we didn't assume breach scenario. So we did focus on that post access, what was going to happen if there was another breach, whether it was through a zero day, whether it was through supply chain an insider threat, regardless of scenario, we were going to start behind their initial defenses and their perimeter. 
And so Scythe, we were hired to perform all the three major red uh, purple team roles, including red, blue, and the, do the cyber threat intelligence research. But the challenge here was that it could only be tuning the technology that was there and that no mo new money could be spent on new technologies, new security controls, things like that. And so that was a challenge that Purple Team we were able to do. And so to build out how we were going to do these six weeks was we were going to use the cyber threat intelligence research that we did to outline uh, several different adversaries. In this case, we had four specific adversaries that had uh, different levels of sophistication and different levels of like execution methods, things like that, so that we could continue to measure the maturity of our organization and as we were building defenses that was sort of a key thing so we had our first week we were just doing baseline testing to make sure everything was working and to see what where are we starting with because that's a really important part of purple teaming is measuring and so as we went through each week we could sort of test again and again build new detections but each new week we tried something a little different so that was going to see whether our detections were overly specific to the test we did the previous week or whether it would work against sort of a new adversary. And so, of course, then we got to the last week where we had free play. This is something where a red team could do whatever they want. They knew what tests had been created. And so they were going to try and get around some of that. And so this was sort of a really nice way of building out in, in six weeks, which is a pretty short time. Uh, try and build out a pretty large set of defenses and detections uh, because we also had to learn the technology. And so this was our baseline. This is week one. So what was uh, tested against? We had 94% of adversary behavior was undetected. Uh, and so that was sort of the, you know, that's always something that organizations that will go through a purple team, this is oftentimes uh, the the first week is is sort of a little bit of a shock because we have, <clears throat> excuse me, they have all these different technologies. We have all these companies, things like that, uh, that we've brought in to help before. Why do we still have, why aren't we able to detect these behaviors? So in this case, a few of them was blocked. I think it was uh, and detected. And so that was some PowerShell sort of initial uh, execution. And so that's where we had uh, some small wins. And so after going through that six weeks of testing, we are able to get up to 64% detected, which meant that uh, we were able to not only see what was happening uh, and, and potentially alert on it, but also that we had new data sources in places. That's where I like to talk about the telemetry that we got with Sysmon. And so this was Event Sentry was the name of the, uh, the scene vendor that they were using. And so we had never worked with them before. And so uh, we had to learn. And again, that's it's a new technology stack. And that's that's part of purple teaming is sort of learning each individual case. And so building out very specific use cases in event sentry for each of these tests. And so uh, event sentry actually published a blog post as a result of this uh, case study in purple teaming as well, and released a couple of the detections and things that that we helped them build. So that's something that just shows, you know, this there was collaboration all around. It wasn't just the you know red and blue and scythe and uh, NM FTA, but it was also other vendors. And so we all sort of came together through purple teaming through this sort of transparent testing methodology, and you know, lots really big results here for six weeks. So that's what we always like to start with. Uh, and part of that is in the full purple juice, not the watered down stuff, uh, George and Bryson at CactusCon this last year. And here's the YouTube video. You can go watch it. It's about 50 minutes. It's a fantastic talk that really dives deep uh, into this, uh, these couple slides that I just went over to sort of show you that overall effect of what purple teaming can have on your organization. So highly recommend checking it out. Let us know what you think. Uh, and, you know, like I said, big results. So going back to the, you know, red teaming and blue teaming, oftentimes there is sort of this uh, clash of, of cultures between the two. And so this is what something I always like to do to sort of set the tone of as we go into purple teaming and as we talk about ethical hacking and things like that is that all offensive security is about providing value. 
everyone is is you know working for the same team here we're all about providing value to the defensive team or the blue team and trying to understand how to better protect your organization and enterprise so this is something that's sometimes lost uh in some of the conversations between red and blue and so this is where i just like to sort of level set this so as far as the ethical hacking maturity model and like how this applies to purple teaming so people think of uh potentially like red teaming and, and where that fits because is it vulnerability scanning are we doing something like that or you know adversary emulation can oftentimes be seen through a very similar lens as red teaming and so how do we sort of differentiate those and so there are you know we have a nice model here that george uh, our cto has has built out and it's called the ethical hacking maturity model but he sort of talks about how vulnerability scanning while it's very much needed as part of enterprise security it is part of something you can build out for a larger capability within your organization and so cves are not what we are testing though when it comes to red team purple team adversary emulation because tactic tactics techniques and procedures are not associated with a specific um cve numbers or release or something like that and so that's that's where there is a very difference in in sort of the mindset around testing because it's not necessarily just a a single value or patch or something like that that you can that can be applied to uh to remediate it it's going to require some deep expertise in not only how to build detections but also how you in your organization like what is what is the false positive rate and things like that that you're you're willing to take on so that's where as you mature it's going to require more investment more time to figure out how this is going to work for you and so i mentioned before assume breach model this is something that uh it really gets to the like high value part of testing uh just focusing on sort of the the edge or, or perimeter of your network is something that especially you know 10 15 years ago was was a very common model for uh for checking to see if if you could get hacked was making sure you had nothing exposed uh and that you patched all of your edge systems well the challenge is that you know everyone makes different uh comparisons here but that you you basically were like you know a tootsie pop you had a, a hard exterior and then a, a gooey center and so that meant that if anybody got past that perimeter it was really difficult to detect them and all of the there would be either no security controls or they would all fail and so that's that's where this sort of defense in depth model of testing came from is not only coming from the exterior how do we do when we come uh when we're just talking about testing from an internal perspective right uh with insider threats things like that this has been a lot more common but making sure that once an adversary is in because it's probably unfortunately going to happen how do you detect them afterward and so that's where the you know final line here that that we say a lot during our purple team exercises is that uh part of the purple team sort of mentality is that you're not just testing your technology you're testing the people the processes and the technology so with that i want to dive into you know our i've talked a little bit about red teams blue teams and, and cti so i'm not going to spend too much time on these but i just want to sort of level set here with what is our goal again for red teams is making the blue team better it's about making the uh defensive team better equipped to handle a real adversary and real response and so that's why their customer is one of the key things i like to highlight so going to the blue team this is the team i mean blue team is really everybody in an organization right you do have dedicated people that are going to sit in the sock that are going to be your responders they're going to be looking and trying to detect on adversary behavior but really it's an organization-wide effort all the way up to the ceo uh because everyone has to you know that email uh clicks you know phishing links things like that are all something and and that user training that i'm sure we all have had to take are all part of how you build out the defensive posture of an entire organization and so that's where blue teaming comes in is it is a little bit of everyone it's all of the teams and so that's why we say it's everyone's responsibility and so basically your customer is the entire organization 
And so that's where when we get to adversary emulation, it's sort of a scoped red team. It's focusing on specific TTPs. Now, uh, as we highlighted with both red teaming and blue teaming, oftentimes a lot of what we're doing is a manual process. That's difficult to, to scale, to build out because it requires uh, either individuals that have specific expertise and hiring in information security is difficult. So how do we sort of scale this? You know, that's what uh, adversary emulation at least tries to focus a little bit more on very specific techniques or threats that are going to target your organization. So that already narrows the scope a little bit in what's being tested. And then as far as the actual effort in doing that, that's where Scythe, we are trying to change uh, how that's being done to automate some of those pieces. And when we get into the lab portion, you'll get to see exactly how we're doing that. And so again, the entire organization is who we're trying to protect here. And so it, you'll notice that adversary emulation also has a sort of blue team centric customer. And so that's why we're moving towards a purple team is so to unite everyone under one banner and, and to make it easier for everyone to uh, sort of be on a single team uh, you know, I'll highlight a little bit uh, a talk I gave last week at the uh, Sands Purple Team Summit, where sort of the future is purple teams. And so it's not that there won't be uh, red teams or blue teams or things like that, but that everyone is going to unite under a single banner that is purple teaming. They're going to uh, have expertise from each of these backgrounds we talked about, but the overall focus is going to be make sure uh, that any new detections, any new uh, defensive technologies, things like that, that are deployed are going to be validated by someone that has a red team background or is developing security testing like that ties in real world adversaries. So that's sort of the, you know, the end goal of this, but that's why, what, what we're building towards with purple teaming. So I've listed out a lot of positive about Purple Team, but here's here's sort of a list on why you would do that, right? Why is sort of the foundation? Why do we need a Purple Team? And so part of the whole idea behind Purple Teaming is it is that transparent, it's, uh, it's a lot of communication, as you'll see when we get into the actual process. And so this is a great way to train new defenders, a new SOC analysts, things like that, because Oftentimes you have, you're combing through noise, trying to find uh, certain signals, right? Adversary techniques, things like that. And so this is where having a purple, purple team who says, we just executed this technique here. Can you go find it, right? Can't, does that show up in the logs? What is the time delay between those things? And so that's a really great way to train new people. So, the, or your current defenders, because that way when they are looking through uh, looking through all of this traffic and having to determine the intent behind some of these adversarial behaviors to see whether it's a sysadmin, for instance, that ran who am I, because they're trying to figure out where, whether they can deploy, deploy a patch with their current, in, um, their current level of permissions, or whether it's an adversary who's trying to determine who opened my email, right, who executed uh, the malicious macros. And so that's the type of thing that the difficulty from the defenders is that you have to determine, you know, who is that, that, that did it and training so that people are familiar with here's, here's what got executed. How do we know in our organization, whether this person that executed it is an adversary or whether they were compromised. So that's where I really like to highlight. I think purple team is a really good way to train people, uh, especially also on the red team side of things or on the security testing is you can see what gets caught, what doesn't get caught, where are detections in your organization really deep uh, with expertise. And so I think that's the kind of thing that's uh, really important. And so this also, I mentioned it's people, process, and technology. We've talked a little bit about the people, the process between security teams. If you've got a large team that uh, requires like elevating uh, and things, right? After we see that a URL is potentially malicious, it goes to a different team. Uh, and there's some like threat intelligence that gets fed in in a different way. That's the kind of stuff that is really important to see. Is there a, is there a time delay, especially when we talk about ransomware? Uh, whenever ransomware is potentially spreading in an organization, time is crucial. So making sure that you have a understanding of 
those time delays in between teams is really important. So again, testing people, the processes, and then again, we're going to get down to the technology here is that as new techniques come out, as new things come out, uh, that's going to be important to understand, does our current configuration allow us to detect these things? And if not, what do we need to do? Is this a, a new tune? Do we need a new technology? Do we need to enable additional features that we didn't have to before? That's the type of thing that's really important with purple teaming. And then of course, uh, the nice thing about uh, purple teaming for red teams is that you can essentially hand over a, a purple team playbook that allows your defenders to continually run a test against what you did during your last test. So a lot of times I'll have red teamers ask me at this point, they're like, oh, so why would I want to give that to them? Because then they'll detect it next time. Well, that's the point. That's why I mentioned before that all uh, offensive security is about providing value. And so if you can replay and, and have, your, uh, have your red team uh, continually work on researching the newest, latest, and greatest techniques and uh, things like that, it will continually level up your organization and that's better for everyone. So as far as an actual purple team exercise, like what does that look like? So it's it can be a either virtual team that sort of meets all together, uh, or it can be, you know, like I said, a very dedicated group of people that that is their full-time job. And some organizations are doing that. That's what I learned uh, firsthand, just how like widespread that had become during the, um, the Purple Team Summit last week is that there were several people that had teams of five, eight people that were dedicated Purple Teams already within their organizations. And so this is something that is already growing uh, as, as far as sort of in a, a movement, so to speak. But as far as what you need for the team, it's sort of that focus on collaboration and communication is that underlying foundation. And then on top of that, we're building CTI, we're building uh, red team expertise. And so this can either be pulling people in from other teams, sending people to training, things like that. But overall, the exercise needs to have that blended expertise to really have um, great effect. And so that's where, uh, you know, walking through some of these, the middle one, is uh, what I like to talk about here is the tabletop discussion uh, with defenders about what is the expectation of what's going to happen. This is a key part of the test. I mentioned before that measurement was was crucial when you were doing purple teams, and that's part of the part of why the return on investment is so high. So if you go through a purple team test and you say, "What are we expecting here?" and then you record all of that, and then you go through and actually execute it, it provides a level of of measurement around where gaps are, not just in technology, but also in the understanding of how the organization's de uh, defended. So, and then of course you can repeat things uh, until everyone is confident that they can detect a new technique. So this is where there's a bunch of different methodologies around red teaming uh, and around uh, frameworks around just testing in general. So I think uh, most people are probably familiar with the cyber kill chain. If not formally, you've at least heard of kill chain and that's sort of where it came out. Uh, we then uh, had the unified kill chain that got released uh, probably a few years later. I want to say it's like five or eight years later uh, that tried to take into account some of the uh, criticisms and weaknesses of the cyber kill chain when it was first released. There's a bunch of financial and regulatory frameworks that are listed there. And the key thing I want to talk about is not just our purple team exercise framework, but the framework we're going to be using from a cyber threat intelligence perspective. And that is the MITRE attack framework. So to talk quickly about the cyber kill chain, just so you all are aware of, of what that looks like in like, it's probably the, the methodology that that most people have at least heard of and so it's like where are we focused here and so drawing back to what i said earlier uh there's a lot of that is sort of reinforcement as we're going through this is that we are focused on assumed breach and so we are at those last two stages testing command and control and actions on objectives and this is because this is where that business impact happens everyone's worried about ransomware so that's why uh why we're focused on this part and so once that's done, the sort of focus becomes what happens next. After someone has gotten execution on your network, what are they going to do? And that is where MITRE ATT&CK comes in. So 
I will caveat this and say MITRE has been focusing on uh, some initial access stuff. You'll see that they have that as one of their columns. Uh, and for a quick breakdown for those of you that might not be familiar with MITRE ATT&CK. So across the top here, we have our tactics. This is our highest level 50,000 foot view. And so this is the adversary's goals that they are trying to achieve. So really high level goals. And then under each of them in the column here is going to be the techniques. This is going to be how the, the technical means by which adversaries achieve those goals. And so you'll notice we have uh, some uh, darker parts of the techniques here. And that's because MITRE released uh, sub techniques, which are sort of an additional breakdown uh, of techniques that are still a little bit too broad. And one of those is like credential dumping. And so Mimi Katz has a lot of different ways of taking credentials, whether from uh, pulling them straight from memory, or if you're doing like uh, credential stealing across domains, things like that. People wanted some additional nuance to a couple of those techniques. And so that's where, uh, and MITRE does, does listen and, and sort of works with community feedback to build this out. And so that's also what makes it such a, a really critical piece of our purple team framework. So we'll get to dive into this a lot, especially in the lab. So you'll see that. So our purple team exercise framework, I mentioned before, here is the download link. You can go download, uh, download it. This is again, uh, our CTO, Georgia Chies, who, who built this out. So we are going to be pushing an update to this in the next, uh, next little bit because we're going to incorporate some of the lessons we've learned doing more purple team exercises in addition to building up to advanced purple teams. And that's where like the purple maturity model comes into play. So overall methodologies are great, but how to apply them is where things always are. Some of the, the it's the most difficult part of it. And so the nice thing about the purple team exercise framework is that George, uh, George has worked for a long time in this industry. He's gotten to uh, help co-author and sponsor some of the, the sort of standards and he's seen what works well and what doesn't. And so as part of the purple, time exercise, purple team exercise framework, we have outlined the roles and responsibilities. So, uh, you know, and, and to show you how closely we tie, uh, you know, our purple teams to this, this is literally part of uh, our statements of work, our proposals. We outline each of these titles. So, you know, the, the key one I want to point out here at the bottom is the project manager. This is the exercise coordinator. This is a person that has the hardest job on all purple team exercises because they have to coordinate between everyone. And so this is somebody that doesn't even necessarily need to have a super deep uh, technical background and understanding because they're there to make sure that the right people are in the room and to understand, you know, when, when is the time to move, uh, move to the next technique. And so, of course, you're going to have your red team, your blue team that are going to be there. Your red team is going to be running those tests in real time. Blue team is able to provide uh, whether they can see like dashboard views, things like that. And then cyber threat intelligence. This is something that you can either rely on MITRE ATT&CK for and how they've outlined some of the groups and techniques, or you can have internal cyber threat intelligence. For instance, if you have your own uh, threat intel team that can see exactly what types of adversaries are attacking you, if you've had compromises in the past, those are really important pieces of information to feed into this exercise because that's gonna get you a much higher return uh, on your purple team exercise. So. We've outlined these roles and responsibilities. These are all outlined in the Purple Team Exercise Framework. So it is really there as like a cheat sheet for you. It's really great. I pull it up and use it every time I'm running a Purple Team. So the tough part of any information security talk is like, how do we convince people that, yes, I'm sold on Purple Teaming. What do we, how do we sell it to others? And our, within our own organization, how do I get buy-in from my manager? And so part of the way we recommend doing this is, is trying to go through one and, and even doing a single thing. We're going to walk through in the lab, going through an entire adversary, but starting out with a single technique or a single set of procedures to show how in an hour, in four hours, here's exactly what we were able to do. That's where I talked, uh, I've talked a lot about measuring, right? 
measuring the before and after. What is that expected? Uh, what is the expected thing that should happen when we test this specific technique? Do we have a detection in place for it? Okay, if the answer is yes, then, then what should pop up? And write down who should see that technique and all of that. And then at the end of it, you run the test. Did it work? Did it not? What matched? And so providing that sort of before and after and then any adjustments that were made and, and close those gaps, that for the most part I've seen has had a lot of success in uh, bringing purple teams from just either a single technique or, or a part partial day to a multi-day or as I uh, presented at the beginning, uh, our sort of case study was that's how we got to our six week uh, purple team engagement. So it's, you know, your organization best and sort of the path to get there. But this is some of the success that we've seen with organizations that we've worked with. So time requirements. So I, I talked about this a little bit already. Um, purple teams are normally pretty involved. And so oftentimes uh, a single day can get through and sort of a, showing what gaps are going to be there. However, there it's not going to allow potentially enough time for any new detection engineering that needs to be happen or things to be pushed out to workplaces, uh, workstations, if you are testing prevention controls, things like that. So those are things to all take into account when you are trying to build out a purple team uh, or even an exercise. But testing a single set of procedures or single technique, uh, you can probably do it in a few hours. And as we showed, you can also do this for weeks at a time. And some organizations are literally turning purple teaming into its own team that that is doing that is their job for the entirety of the year. So that's where we're, we're seeing the return on investment is so high that that people are putting more time, more resources toward it. But again, I'm always a fan of, you know, start small when you can. Uh, you know, if you're really bought into purple teaming and can get a larger time frame, that's great. But if you need to sort of build up a, a good track record of what Purple Teams got you, you can do it in small increments of time and build out from there. So cyber threat intelligence, you may notice this looks similar to the cyber kill chain. Well, I had uh, two, I had two coworkers back when I worked at MITRE, and neither of them work at MITRE anymore either, but Katie Nichols, who is now the, uh, I think she's the director of Threat Intelligence at Red Canary, which is also an awesome company. And then Cody is at SpectreOps. And so they did a really awesome talk on, they called it attacking the status quo. And so they showed how you can build out adversary emulation plans using MITRE ATT&CK as sort of a foundation framework. And so they outline this, uh, basically a step-by-step -step of what you need to do. Now, it's step-by-step -step in that it is, it is a methodology, it is generic, and it's something that you are going to have to understand how the, your own steps are going to be applied within your organization. But overall, this is how George and myself build out our Threat Thursday adversary emulation plans uh, when we're looking at them, is we follow a very similar methodology to this. So understanding the target organization. So this is something that if you're building a generic plan, that might be a little bit more difficult to make. Uh, for instance, if you're doing like services. However, if you are an internal team or if you are a, uh, someone that's internal to a company and you're saying, I want to incorporate new threat intelligence, you need to understand who is targeting your industry, who is targeting you. Maybe it's a response uh, that your team's done if you're, if you're in the SOC. And so identifying that adversary. Uh, attribution is really difficult, you know, and I know this is something that, you know, could, could span its own set of talks, but identifying at least the malware families or the types of adversaries that are targeting you and getting any sort of reports. There's a lot of threat intelligence vendors, but this is where going to MITRE ATT&CK. It's all open. It's all cited. So you can go and see which reports the techniques were pulled from. So I always recommend people go and do that as sort of a start take out those T TPs so you can either do things at a really high level like the tactics and then sort of build from there, or you can go really deep down to specific procedures, including you know command line flags and that kind of thing. And so this is gonna depend on your organization and what type of tests you wanna do. Once that's done, analyze and organize. So the way I like to sort of talk about this is that order of operations matters with some adversaries. 
some once they get uh, once they get initial execution, they're going to try and laterally move because they want to try and establish you know additional uh, connections before trying to do anything. Others are going to try and figure out where they landed and do a lot of information gathering. Maybe they'll try privilege escalation. And so some of those differences between adversaries is going to you know, ref be reflected in, again, that order of operations. So that is important when you are creating a plan instead of just executing one thing at a time. So from there, you sort of uh, you have your, your techniques laid out, create a formal plan. And this is where you would say, we're going to execute this. Here's the procedure. And, and here's the, going to be the results. And once that's done, that's where you actually emulate it. You go and you deploy it. And so depending on what type of purple team you're doing, if you're doing just a single exercise with a single technique, this might be a pretty short process where you say, we're going to go with one single technique. And so it, it can move you almost right to the end. But as you're building plans for uh, sophisticated adversaries or advers that, that don't have as much public threat intelligence, you're going to have to sort of pull bits and pieces from where you can, and then also potentially make some guesses uh, at, on what are some other things they're doing. And so that's where the creating a plan part can be a little bit more difficult because you are becoming an expert, at least on that emulation plan, and you're sort of building out as a result. So that's something I do like to highlight. This is really great. We have links to all this. We will also share the slides at the end. So, um, you know, this is being recorded and we, we share the recordings uh, and we also have the slides that we share. So no worries about any of that. Probably should have said that at the beginning as far as the slides, but uh, if you've taken notes up to this point, just means that you've got extra credit. All right. So when I talk about cyber threat intelligence and like the difficulty of responding to things, uh, this is, you can look at this as two ways. So, uh, it was interesting. I always presented this from, I guess, what would be more of a red team view until, uh, you know, listening to George and a couple of other people talk about it from a more blue team view as well. And so I'll walk through both because I think it's really interesting. This is David Bianco's Pyramid of Pain, who's, uh, and it's Pyramid of Attacker Pain is really what it was here is like, how much uh, cost can you inflict on attackers if they have to change things? And so starting at the very bottom, the most broad category that everyone has probably seen from one way or another is hash values. So from an attacker perspective, it's very easy to change hash values. And especially we'll show you in Scythe how it's, it's even easier to do that. So it's literally button clicks. And so hash values are gonna change. Uh, they're the fingerprint of the file essentially. And any small change is gonna alter it in a way that uh, should make it unrecognizable from the previous version. And so that's where uh, it's really easy. A lot of indicators of compromise and things like that come out as hash values. And so you can incorporate them as a defender and have, uh, have all your defensive tools look for it. And so, but if adversaries can change that so easily, then that means, you know, adversaries will continue to operate with largely uh, unimpeded access uh, going forward. And so that's where we start moving up. Like, how do we make it more difficult? IP address, how hard is it for adversaries to change IP addresses? Well, in these days with uh, some of the provisioning tools and automation, especially with the cloud, it's actually really easy. And this sort of goes to domain names now as well. I sort of have begun to lump these together because uh, especially if they are doing, you know, depending on the different techniques uh, and if they're doing like domain fronting or, or relays, there's a lot of different things that you can do uh, as an ad that adversaries can do in order to make it difficult to to really stop them even just by having IP addresses that are blocked at your perimeter or within your uh, sort of defensive structure. And so now we get up to like the the network and, and host artifacts. So this is things that are going to appear after you've run them. Uh, after like malware or specific techniques have run, they're going to be left behind. And so this is where as a defender, if you can, if a specific like file path and things like that, uh, this requires a bit more uh, changing of things on the adversary side. Adversaries are people too. I like to remind everybody that. And so they have their own experts that they have to go and get time. They have to pay to, to gain capability. And so if you're able 
to make them have to go and call in their, their expert to change a file path or figure out a new way to do something. That's sort of these, these last three pieces here are on forcing additional the adversary to use additional expertise. And so that's where it gets from, you know, we start here, it's annoying to have to change like file paths, things like that in, in sort of malware. But then when you make them change the tools they're using, and then at the very, very top, if we, if we go to like MITRE ATT&CK, which focuses on the adversary's behaviors and those tactics, techniques, and procedures, if you make them shift entirely how they operate, that is a major undertaking. That is major capability shift. It means that they potentially can't use previous work. They have to do new research. And then just as that's hard for red teamers and that kind of thing, you know, in the, uh, in the ethical hacking side of, of things, it is very much the same for adversaries. And so when they are trying to break in and they have to create brand new tools every time, that is a major cost. And so that's, that's where if you can start blocking, detecting the behaviors, and that requires, that is more difficult to, defend, to, to build defenses for. But if you can do it, it's going to make it much, much more difficult for adversaries to compromise you and to have success within your environment. So how do we extract TTPs? You know, if any of you that have seen a report, uh, this is from a, a FireEye report, and this is a uh, screenshot is from that talk that uh, Katie and Cody gave, is this was a FireEye report, and this is how you extract the MITRE ATT&CK techniques out of it. And so this is where you can pull out a bunch of different things. Uh, you know, you can pull out specific execution methods. We still have hash values. Now, this is from a couple of years ago, and so if you go look at new cyber threat intelligence reports, you'll often notice at the very end, they have this nice list of MITRE ATT&CK techniques and all of the different uh, tags and things like that. And so it links directly to, to attack. And so you can go and sort of uh, view it. You don't have to do as much of the extraction yourself. So that's at least really nice uh, and sort of a change that's happened over the last two to three years. Uh, but this is sort of, if, you're, if you come to a report that hasn't been uh, that hasn't had anything, for instance, if you have your own internal threat, uh, cyber threat intelligence uh, that generates a report that maybe isn't as mapped to attack, this is how you would do it. And so from here, you can then use the attack navigator, which is again, another, <coughs> excuse me, another MITRE tool that highlights the sort of breadth of the test that you're doing because you're not going to test everything at once. You don't want to test everything at once because that is going to sort of overwhelm. You're going to have so much data, it's going to be tough to parse through. So if you're tackling only very specific techniques and procedures, that's going to allow you to really drill down on how you do as an organization against these techniques. And so this is, uh, I find a really good view for sort of communicating breadth, especially to like senior leadership teams, uh, because they aren't going to uh, necessarily have the, the background and understanding to dive into specific techniques, but they can understand how, like, how you're testing, especially when you overlay this with a specific threat group that is targeting your organization. And so you can see that overlap, and it's a really powerful communication tool. So I highly recommend this, uh, and we'll also show how you can have views like this in Scythe or export the attack navigator. So once you have looked through some cyber threat intelligence, you've pulled everything out, and this is that order of operations I mentioned before. And so analyzing and organizing everything. So this is putting it together. We'll have an example here where I'll show orange worms. So I'm not gonna stay too long on this slide, but this is again, all this stuff is outlined in the uh, purple team exercise framework. So uh, you know, use that as a reference and you'll see this in all of our Threat Thursday blog posts because this is a really nice way of, of talking about it. And you'll have your tactics on the left that you can shift around depending on which tactic overall adversaries are trying to achieve first. Now, sometimes they'll do the same type of tactic. They may use defense evasion in a few different places. And so you can either choose to reflect that by changing that order of operations, or you can have it all as one large tactic and have all the techniques in there. So it's just different ways. It's going to depend on how you want to do your testing and how you want to organize. 
So I've mentioned Threat Thursdays a few times. Uh, it's I like to reference it because it's a great template. So uh, of course, anybody that's a Scythe customer can leverage our emulation plans uh, immediately once we release them. However, we also recognize that uh, you know, the greater inf information security community and, and sort of having access to, to expertise like this is, is not always a given. And so that's why we have, we do release our blog posts under this Threat Thursday link here. And it includes all that breakdown that I showed up, up before. And so it's got the, how we look through the cyber threat intelligence. So it has the different sources that we look through. And from there, we then break it down. We have all the different techniques. We have an explanation on, you know, what are some of the difficulties when you're trying to detect these things? And that's released for everyone. So also our site threats are all in JSON. So that's something that, you know, you can, you can go and look through how we're doing that as well. So that is something that, you know, we have provided free to the community to help you all build out additional emulation plans for within your own organization, because uh, threat emulation is, yeah, you know, we love it, and and we want you to sort of see the value in it too. So we have the largest uh, public library of threats. So do like to sort of throw that out, and I want to give a shout out to George who has been really on top of you know the quick turnaround, dark side ransomware, and Conti. We both released those a few days after their major attacks, um, and so partially that's because the cyber threat intelligence is has been available for some of those ransomware groups. And they just made some high profile uh, hits. And so trying to make sure that people are uh, can understand what's happening with those threats and test against them it is really critical. So here's Orange Room, uh, which we're going to dive into a little bit in our lab. And so it's a group that targeted uh, healthcare organizations. So you'll sort of see this breakdown of different techniques here. So this is, you know, we had to keep everything on one slide. Uh, so that's where it's not quite, uh, not as much white space as I might have uh, for each of the techniques. But the key thing here is that this is this is a quick one slide of what we're testing. So it's it's really nice in that regard. We're testing, you know, we're not testing every single tactic. It's going to be testing execution, defense evasion, discovery, persistence, and potentially lateral movement, depending on what you want to do with your testing. And so. That's where you can outline exactly the types, the focus of the test really quickly. It also allows you to see, uh, like for instance, in discovery here, we have a ton of different techniques being leveraged. And so you can see where adversaries have spent their time in developing capability. And so that can also allow you to plan for future tests. What are some of the areas you should focus on uh, looking for them? So with any purple team, we always get this question, you know, virtual or remote, uh, especially with the pandemic and COVID, everything was pretty much virtual. So we've been doing purple team exercises virtually for over the past year. And so we've used like Zoom. The key thing we have here is that everyone needs to be able to share. And so, uh, you know, whenever we're running the tests, I will pull up and show the Scythe platform is what we use uh, for our tests, of course. And as things are running, any new tests that I'm running, I, I show my screen so that all of the defenders can see exactly what's happening and I can explain what's going on on the screen. Now, when we're looking for detections, that's when we'll, I'll stop sharing. We have uh, folks that are in the SOC are going to share uh, their screen, what they're seeing, what their specific dashboards that they're looking at. That's sort of, that's really critical because it's not that they're just sharing with me, but we have their entire team on most of the time. And so their team can see what is, what is that thought process that we go through? And that, that sort of process that we mentioned in the people process technology, that's where, especially if you have a multi-tiered SOC, like tiers one, two, and three, we would start with tier one. What does this look like? What would cause this to be escalated? All right, what does that escalation process look like? And then they would shift over to the tier two person and work through that. And so we are able to test everything through, you know, virtually, where normally, of course, this would be an in-person meeting where everyone's sitting in a conference room and can either have like a projector that someone plugs into or a screen, or everyone could huddle around uh, somebody's computer. But that's where this is going to depend on, you know, whether what type of uh, 
organization you are, because if you are just doing this all internally, maybe it's really easy for you to get all the stakeholders into a single room, but doing services and stuff like that, like we do, that's where you're going to be, uh, you know, trying to, to figure out what is the best way to make sure that we are going to be able to get all of our stakeholders in the meeting. And so virtual has been, been the way to do that for the past year. So testing in production versus in a test environment. Another question we get all the time, uh, test in production. So that's, uh, you know, we, we always test in production. Production is where all of your defensive, uh, like tools are engaged. This is how you actually test the, the entirety of that people processes technologies. Because if not, if certain technologies aren't deployed because it's a test bed, then you're not going to be able to evaluate those as well. Also, there's a lot of noise normally in a normal environment. And so sometimes running in test environment, you can turn all of those detections super highly uh, so that everything that, that happens on a system is going to generate a, an alert, which might be great from the win perspective, but what we're, we're not trying to just win or lose here. We're trying to determine how likely is this organization uh, going to be successful when coming up against a real ransomware threat actor. And so that's why you test in production, you test to see whether or not there, there are tunings that you can do. Uh, PowerShell is a, a key one we always run into. Certain environments have tons of PowerShell in the background. Uh, and if you think that you don't have a ton of PowerShell, you know, that that's great. Uh, oftentimes we've found that that's, that's not the case. People just weren't monitoring it as well as they thought. Uh, so that's something that, you know, a lot of provisioning tools and that kind of thing, orchestra, uh, IT orchestration tools all use encoded PowerShell in the background and, and as their backend. So that's the kind of stuff that if you rely on those tools, it's going to be harder to build detections for PowerShell, but trying to understand, are there certain uh, characteristics of that IT tool that we can, we can essentially say, all right, this, we have a high degree of confidence that this is the specific provisioning tool and not an adversary. Those are all the reasons you're going to test. You should test in production. We also uh, recommend testing against client and servers. So we have seen and had uh, have had several different customers that have had different uh, defensive stacks on their endpoints versus on their servers. And so if you don't test both of those you may potentially have a pretty massive gap in coverage on one of those or certain technology doesn't work as you think it does. And so testing on both Windows, Linux, Mac, if you have it, and then like uh, servers versus endpoints, if you do have cloud infrastructure testing there as well. So it sounds like a lot to test because I mean, it is well, IT uh, and, and in general, the infrastructure organizations have to maintain these days is potentially it's more complex than ever. Uh, there's all these different systems, especially if you start having adding like legacy systems or, or OT environments into the mix, it gets really complicated really quickly. And so testing where adversaries are going to be testing is going to be uh, is going to be really important. So uh, and that's where, especially when you get to ransomware, that's where something like with Scythe, you'll see we're able to test ransomware in production without having the destructive impact and effects that you would normally see from ransomware. And you'll get to see and play around with some of that in the lab. So I mentioned this before, making sure all of your systems that you're testing on have all of your security tools. This is really important. This is not about trying to bypass EDR or anything like that. It is more on trying to understand what can we see? What can we not see? What is What do we have? Are we just blind to? And so having all of the people there that can monitor those dashboards, things like that is gonna be really important. And so that's where, again, we just try and say replicate as much as possible in the test as it would be in, in sort of your real environment. So we have a couple different team slides here, you know, just to make sure that uh, you, know, you do identify if, if you are doing a purple team, notifying uh, different people so you're, IR team, unless you're trying to test that process, it's not all of a sudden going to get, you know, uh, get calls in the middle of the night because all of a sudden, you know, something was detected and they need, they need to respond. So there are purple teams that you can, you can test those types of things and test those response times. Uh, 
But overall, you just want to make sure that uh, you have your setup, you've notified the correct people, and also that you've shared what type of testing you're going to be doing. So uh, sometimes you can do blind tests uh, or, or no notify tests, but we always recommend additional transparency because that's, that's how you get some of the biggest return on investment. And so we have a good link there to the threat hunting playbooks uh, that have also been released, uh, not by us, uh, but we like to highlight good work that's been done uh, also in the community. So same with your digital forensics and service response team. As I mentioned before, if you have digital forensics tools that are specific, having those available is great to sort of test that out as well um, and working through that entire process. So, you know, all the way from a tier one uh, analyst first responding to, you know, doing a incident uh, management and sort of remediation process. It's good to test as much as you can, obviously, uh, depending on your time and resources, and that's going to limit what you can do. So kicking off the exercise, one of the key points here that, that sometimes, uh, especially when we're doing it, we always request that whoever the sponsor of the Purple Team exercise is the one who kicks it off. Having buy-in and having people uh, that, that understand the value of it that sort of give that, that first talk is really critical because it sort of solidifies that this is a joint effort. This is a collaborative effort by everyone that's in the room. And so it's meant to sort of motivate everyone because oftentimes these things start you know, in early morning uh, and not everyone's a, a morning person. And so that's where it's, it's oftentimes going to be a full day and there's potentially gonna be some, some sort of uh, startling discoveries that happen during purple teams. Most of the ones we've been on have all had that where we execute something and everyone expects that they're gonna be able to see the ransomware uh, emulation as it happens and then nothing pops up. And so that's, you know, that's something that making sure that there's like buy-in from leadership, there's confidence from leadership that this is going to be an exercise in understanding and building and not on shaming is, is, is a really big thing. And so by incorporating some of the people from the organization, it really helps with that. So overall, this is sort of our six step exercise flow of color coordinated each of the, of the things to sort of show where each team uh, really the expertise ties in. And so the exercise coordinator is going to kick everything off. They're going to present exactly what is being tested, uh, potentially technical details, if that's something you want to go into, and then have that tabletop discussion. That is, what do we expect is going to happen? Recording what is going to happen. And then from there, the red team actually kicking off the test, running the test maybe once, maybe multiple times, depending on what you want to do. And then uh, ideally, you have the blue team. It's going to tell you whether something worked or not. So the reason I say ideally, there are times where we've said, all right, we ran this test and it was a double digit hour delay before the logs came in. And so obviously that, you know, recording the amount of time there and, and luckily it was a multi-day exercise. So we figured that out the next day, but that's something that's really critical. And so once, if you're able to have the, the blue team identify the logs, they can point out what happened. And then maybe if there was a gap, if you have the right people in the room, they can start on that detection engineering. And so from there, you can either move on, repeat the procedure and test out your new detections, or while people are working on detections for that one, you can go to the next. And so this is all cyclical uh, and the exercise coordinator is the one who is maintaining the tempo for the entire team. Uh, and that's, that's just how the entire day is going to go. So it's very methodical. It's very, you know, step-by-step step, and, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the same thrill of, you know, red teamers going through it and, and finding all these things, but that's why we are able to measure the results and show that return on investment so well is because you're able to be very deliberate in every step you're taking. And it is, has a very specific, um, times when you bring in the red team, when you do the specific tests, oftentimes that test is going to be backed by cyber threat intelligence. So it's so sort of just accepting the risk is something that you're accepting risk with context, which adds a bit of weight to it. Because if an adversary that often targets companies like yours is, is actively using that uh, technique, then 
it's it's a little harder to just write it off. And so that's what all this is about is making sure that, you know, not just making it harder to write off risk or things like that, but also tailoring the tests to be more specific to your organization and to your field. So recording your reporting, you'll get to play around with uh, Vector today. Uh, we have a webinar with PlexTrack at the end of the week, if you're interested in some more integrations with that. And then we have good old fashioned Excel and uh, any sort of just record keeping that and note taking that you wanna do. So these are three different uh, ways we have run purple teams. And so you're just gonna put that in. I've got some screenshots here. It's a little bit blurry. You, I promise you'll get to go and test out vector in the lab. And so you can see this. And so on the left, uh, the nice thing here is that Scythe will populate this for you in the lab. Uh, so the red team details are all filled out and you just have to go on the blue team side and say, all right, was this detected? Was this blocked? Was it not detected, but it was logged. And so you can sort of build out your entire purple team exercise in this tool. And so PlexTrack has a lot of the same. So Plex, uh, Vector is a free tool, uh, PlexTrack is paid. Um, and so that's, that's sort of uh, something for your organization to weigh. But I do like to show screenshots of both of them uh, because we've used both successfully in our purple teams. Uh, and so it's really about recording and that's where the exercise coordinator, they've got the toughest role because they're driving everything and they're also taking notes on like, uh, and, and sort of recording all of those responses from each team. And so they're sort of the, the main one responsible for putting all of it together into the final report. And so at the very end of this, so as we're, we're sort of coming to the end of the lecture portion here, lessons learned is critical to making sure that you are able to distill down what happened uh, so that you can either do it again or provide that feedback on how good the, this exercise was. And so I mentioned this before, exercise coordinator is going to have the hardest job of this by far because they're taking notes, they're taking action items, feedback, they are sending out emails to attendees about what happened during the day, what to expect for the next day, and sort of that. And then, of course, the creation of a final lessons learned document uh, following each exercise. And so this is the key here is to make sure you sort of um, you capitalize on the momentum of the exercise. So oftentimes after you've done an exercise, everyone sees the value. It's great. Everyone is is hyped up for purple teaming. And then if the report gets delayed a couple of weeks or a month or two, then it sort of fades. Um, and so that's where capitalizing and making sure that you as the, the people that are running the purple team provide all of those action items so people can work on them. Now, I will say, especially when we've been emulating ransomware, no one is concerned about waiting very long for a report. They all want it now so that they can start going and trying to get resources allocated to address any gaps. But this is just something that, again, it's going to require potentially a quick turnaround. And that's why that exercise coordinator role is the most important one in the entire purple team. So I've mentioned the purple maturity model a few times. And so this is sort of uh, right, right at the end of our slides here, because I want to show you where purple team is going. And so uh, this was from my presentation last week. Uh, that we did at the Sands Purple Team Summit, and then we did at the Red Team Village Mayhem Talk, George and I did on Saturday. And so this is breaking Purple Team down. Instead of talking about the Cyber Threat Intelligence, Red Team, Blue Team, it's what would a dedicated Purple Team like and how would you measure their skills? And so we have this detection understanding versus threat understanding. And not everyone's gonna start at the bottom left, which is just deployment. That's using other people's tools. Um, integration is, is sort of a step up from that, is being able to take multiple tools, combine them together for greater effect. And then of course, at our sort of pinnacle for both is creation, being able to create novel techniques, being able to create novel detections, and then combine those in, in order to build a really strong purple team at our top right. Now, the challenge here is that a lot of teams have a really strong uh, blue team. They've built out a sock that has like, you know, multi layers. It's got all these things. And so they have this really deep detection understanding. But depending on how you've got things set up, you may not have all of the testing 
that's necessary to validate those. And so that's where that threat understanding is really important. And so if we're sort of charting a path between this, the squares here, it's trying to balance out your team as much as possible. Because if you build detections but can't validate them, then you, you really don't have, uh, you're not gonna understand whether or not they're, they're actually gonna trigger when an adversary comes in and supposedly meets the conditions that you've outlined. Uh, and you potentially are also going to have an analyst that has no idea what to do once those have, once those have gone off. And so we've seen this in real time with our purple team exercises, and, and you have, may have seen it in your own organization or services too, where uh, a detection goes off and they're like, well, this was written by somebody five years ago. And so they have to track down like how that even came to be because they're like, well, it's a good detection, but we don't know where it came from or anything like that. And so that's really the importance of balancing both a threat and detection understanding. So, uh, you know, and that's, uh, if you're interested in hearing more about the talk, that is also on YouTube, I'll include a link. Uh, and you can always follow me on Twitter if you want to get some of that. So we have our resources. This is something that George and Bryson and a couple of others from across industry have built out the C2 matrix. So talking about that threat understanding, that sort of red team and CTI blend, there's all these different tools. Red teamers are very active developers. And so they are releasing new variants and versions of uh, post-exploitation frameworks, that kind of thing. And so there's this massive list of them. And so depending on what you're trying to test, uh, you might need a different tool. So Scythe is also on here. So you can compare us against uh, a couple of the other uh, other things. So, but we always like to, again, sort of recognize uh, big work that's being done within the community and, and highlight that because it is a, a valuable resource. And of course, you all hopefully are here to test out and run Scythe. So I'm not gonna spend too long on this because you're gonna get to dive right in. But the key things I wanna really uh, highlight with us is that this is a platform that allows you to do repeatable testing and you don't need to have a lot of adversary emulation to get started, uh, like expertise. We build out these those threat Thursdays that I told you before. It's two clicks to import it. You'll import a threat while we're going through the lab and see just how simple that is. So the key thing we are doing with our customers is we are building this platform that allows them to repeatedly test and validate their techniques, their detection engineering, to see how they are doing against the latest threats. And allows a lot of customization so that if your organization has the expertise or the time to build out uh, additional tests and, and custom tests, you can do that. And so again, we'll walk through a bunch of this uh, in the lab. And then I always, you know, I'll be on the entire time so that we can answer any questions. So we have a lot of features and capabilities, including different command and control. We have focused on, we really focused on trying to replicate what real malware does. Because, you know, having, you know, I, I, I have a red team background. George has a, a bit of a red team background as well from his time uh, running at the offensive security team at City. But the, the focus here is not on new, cool, novel techniques that, that we can come up with, but on what you're going to go against uh, day in, day out. And so that's really important to us. And so that's, again, uh, you know, if there's something that you feel that should be here that isn't, let us know. You know, we're always happy to hear feedback. And so this is, you know, the sort of sales pitch part of it. Um, but we, you know, I'm, I'm really happy to be able to use this tool and showcase this tool. I came from a background of a lot of uh, different organizations that were trying to automate these types of things with customers, but they were research organizations. And so we were trying to, to work with tools and, and there was nothing there that, that really, um, you know, scratched the itch in the, in the way that was needed to, um, to transfer that capability. So that's why I'm here at Scythe. And so uh, this is to highlight a couple of those uh, purple teaming talks. And then we also have a swag store. So most of you that may know Scythe know that uh, we're all about some good swag. So we've got a lot of like purple shirts. We've got uh, also have red team, blue team. You know, if there's a specific one, we have things for babies, pets, anything you could uh, need. And so, you know, this is going to save the chubby unicorns, unicorns being, of course, our mascot and chubby unicorns are rhinos who a lot of a lot of them are endangered. So 
and you get some cool swag as well. So if you've been to a conference before COVID times, you probably have at least a few site stickers. Um, but yes, we encourage you all to interact with us both through the store, obviously, but also on Twitter. We're at site.io underscore IO. And of course, you can follow me. I'm T.E. Schultz.